Um, <laughs> can, I, can I first of all thank Artichoke and uh, Durham City Council for uh, hosting us during Lumia, um, which has, I have to say has been one of the most magical experiences. It's truly incredible. And uh, uh, we've been inspired, as some of you may know, to create our own Lumia Festival in London in January next year. And um, some might say we've stolen the idea. Uh, I'd like to say we've been inspired. And um, uh, I, I hope that we can do justice to the concept and, uh, and, and do something just as spectacular uh, in our own city. And certainly um, the, the images from Leon have certainly raised our game as well. Um, but I, what I want to talk about um, this morning is really relates to uh, events like Lumia and the power that cultural events and festivals have in the life of a city and in the importance of civic traditions. Uh, it, we're going through a very interesting and remarkable period in human history in that for the first time ever, the majority of humans live in towns and cities uh, we are an urban species, 54% of us uh, will live in an urban environment. And that figure is expected to grow uh, to about 66% by 2050. So that's a phenomenal change in the experience that most human beings have in what is a relatively short amount of time. And that change, that move to an urban environment raises all sorts of questions and all sorts of opportunities and challenges. 90% of that growth in the urban population over the next few decades will be in the developing world. And in places like India, Africa, South America, you can already see the massive growth of cities, uh, not just cities on the typical scale that we've seen in Europe and North America and other parts of the uh, developed world, but mega cities, cities of 10 million plus and places where uh, we haven't seen urban development on that kind of scale before. In 1948, Gandhi said about India that the future of his country lay in the 700,000 villages uh, that, that populated uh, the countryside. And in fact, he wasn't correct. The future of India is very much in cities like Mumbai and Delhi, which have grown uh, and become huge magnets for population growth. People are actually leaving the villages in India and they're going to live in cities. And they're searching for better jobs, for security, for health, for better quality of life. And the same is happening in other parts of the world. In China, even more so than in India, the population is urbanizing. Half of the population of China now lives in towns and cities. And the number of villages has decreased from about 3.6 million to 2.7 million in the space of about 10 years. It's a phenomenal rate of change. And you can see that it's having all sorts of implications for those countries. The turn to cities, as lots of people will know, is an incredibly positive development. Uh, the fact that people are moving to cities means that they're likely to live longer lives, they're likely to live healthier lives, they'll have access to health and education facilities that they wouldn't have in their villages. They're more likely to uh, see their children go to school, to live longer, uh, to have jobs. And the World Bank has said that in the last 30 or so years, about half a billion people have been lifted out of poverty because countries have started to modernize and urbanize. And city living, as well as bringing all these economic benefits, these very practical benefits to people's lives, also tend to be more liberal, they tend to be more cosmopolitan. People who come together, who live together uh, from different communities, different backgrounds, uh, tend to be more tolerant. Uh, the opportunities for women tend to be greater. Uh, women are more likely to be employed in cities, they're more likely to have access to education and for that to be accepted and welcomed. Of course, that's not to say that urban life doesn't come without its problems, of course it does. And we know that in cities like Mumbai, even though on average people live longer, healthier lives, a large, large number of people will live in slums. Half of, half of the population of Mumbai, which is about five, billion, five million people, uh, will be living in slums. In Rio, we know that the favelas, which are about two million people, uh, are meant to be sort of temporary homes and temporary accommodation are actually a permanent fact of life in those cities. And a lot of these mega cities places where people search for opportunity are actually places that have trapped people into um, desperate situations. 
And city governments all around the world are very conscious that people living in these very poor and terrible conditions, uh, living in cheap housing, uh, traveling long hours to get to places of work for low pay, all these populations in their cities are very vulnerable to crime, to drug and alcohol addiction, to gangs, and that they suffer because of the inadequate investment in the infrastructure of those cities. And what we've seen in the recent decades is the real push from NGOs, from the UN, uh, from city governments themselves to try and improve the infrastructure in, in those uh, slums. And there's been a, a considerable investment in the favelas and uh, in parts of Mumbai to try and uh, address some of those issues. And the, the emphasis very much in city government, and I say this as someone who works in a city in the developed world, the emphasis uh, across the world has been very much on the physical infrastructure. What can we do with buildings, with bricks and mortar? What can we do with transport infrastructure to improve people's lives? But increasingly in the last 10 years or so, cities have also woken up to another dimension, an important dimension in the rapid urbanization of the world. And that is the cultural dimension of cities as well. When you have very large numbers of people moving from a rural to an urban environment, essentially they are transforming not just their economic opportunities, they're transforming their very way of life, the people that they relate to, the people that they know. They're entering into environments which are essentially strange and full of strangers. They are meeting people who they don't have an automatic connection with, that they have no family ties to, no kinship ties with, uh, they are entering a completely different state of consciousness. And that mass migration, the large numbers of people who are moving into cities, are developing new identities, and there are all sorts of anxieties and concerns about what it means to live in a city where uh, you've gone from being in a population of about 100 or 200 people to being part of a population of 10 million. And of course that has all sorts of implications for how people live and the kind of mental health and emotions they might feel. Of course, the questions that are raised are not new, in that the questions uh, about identity, about kinship, about community, were questions that sociologists grappled with in the 19th century when the first European cities really started to emerge. And in, in those situations, in places like Paris, Vienna, uh, uh, London, Rome, sociologists um, which was a, a, an emerging discipline at the time, began to write uh, quite anxiously about the change from rural to city life. And there were uh, uh, sociologists like uh, Ferdinand Tonnes, a German sociologist, who observed that the old forms of community were breaking down and they were being replaced by people who had an impersonal connection to each other. They were driven by uh, the market, they were driven by relationships as customers or as employees. Um, they didn't have the same sense of empathy or sympathy for their fellow neighbours. They saw them in a purely instrumental way. There were sociologists like George Simmel who observed that people in cities were blasé towards each other, that they didn't have that emotional connection, and that even though living in a city brought immense freedom from the old oppression of village life, the fact that everybody knew your business and everybody... Um, felt a sense of uh, control and uh, a, a sense of duty to, to, um, to regulate people's uh, uh, personal lives and their domestic lives. He, he saw that even with that freedom that comes from living in a city, it didn't bring very much mental comfort and that people were disconnected uh, and uh, almost impersonal and unfeeling towards each other. And even those who were more positive about cities, uh, people like Emile Durkheim, who talked about the strength of city relationships, even they observed that people felt a sense of disconnection and were more likely to feel alienated uh, and alone. And in the 19th century, that fear uh, of what city life would bring, something that we can perhaps all empathize with today, um, tended to dominate a huge amount of um, discussion uh, amongst the intellectuals. But actually, as history has shown throughout the, the 19th century and the 20th century, in fact, people in cities did find a way. They did find a way to live together and to overcome their strangeness. And the way that they did it through, throughout all these cities, throughout all these towns, was generally through culture. They used to find uh, ways of bringing the civic traditions uh, that they had lived with in their villages 
the religious, the cultural festivals, the processions through uh, small rural villages would be brought to the city and would be expanded there and would create new forms of civic connection. In fact, rather than cities becoming impersonal places where people uh, only stayed within their own small uh, networks. In fact, what they did was that they um, decided to come together and expand their um, religious and cultural festivals. And in fact, this, the whole uh, architecture of the grand cities of Europe uh, created public squares and piazzas uh, and parks where people could bring um, uh, their religious festivals um, to a greater stage, to a more theatrical stage. And uh, uh, in uh, countries like Italy, the small religious processions uh, would be brought out onto a, a much larger stage. Uh, festivals like Ferragusto, who, uh, which uh, started off as ancient Roman festivals and which have evolved over the centuries and are now celebrated, not just in Italy, but wherever Italian migrants went to. So in the Bronx, in Little Italy, Ferragusto brings thousands of people out every year. And it's a, a link between the Italians and the Italian culture of today to that of its past. Uh, in Lyon, we've seen how a festival which began in the 19th century had evolved through those decades and has now become a major event uh, which attracts millions of people. In Britain, the small villages and marketplaces, their festivals grew into major fairs uh, events like Bartholomew Fair, which started in the 12th century and carried on into the 19th, emerged uh, into major annual events where thousands of people would come to eat, to entertain, uh, to, uh, to purchase, uh, and to come together as part of a city. And uh, these events would be part of the creation of an identity for a city where people uh, uh, who didn't know each other would feel some sense of Connection, And you can see, in fact, uh, and, and this uh, hopefully helps to make sense of the slides that I'm showing behind, um, that these were events that used light very frequently, very often, uh, in order to create moments where people could come together and could focus. And of course, in Britain, uh, Guy Fawkes Night, the use of fireworks, became a very traditional civic moment in the life of almost every town and city. And the affordability of fireworks made it possible for cities and people on a very large scale to come together uh, and to celebrate. And in America, uh, you, you know the, 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 um, the importance of the Christmas light, uh, the Christmas tree lighting in New York, the Rockefeller Center, uh, the way in which that very small tradition, which was started by a group of construction workers uh, who were collecting their wage packets just before Christmas, and they found a, a tree nearby and, and uh, decorated it with uh, paper garlands and tin cans. And that very simple, organic uh, uh, ceremony then evolved into a major event, which was, um, you could say, captured by corporate America, but certainly became a media moment and is now part of um, the American narrative of Christmas. And it's a, an event, the lighting of the Rockefeller tree, um, which attracts thousands of people and millions of viewers on television every year. So despite what um, people in the 19th century feared uh, about cities, in fact, people develop civic traditions and um, uh, uh, cultural events that could bring people together. Why should it matter? because democracies need social capital and they need people um, to feel a sense of connection. And time and time again, research shows that cities with strong governance often are those cities which have strong civic traditions. And people need to be able to participate and come together um, in order to feel a sense of connection. But the challenge for cities today and the rapid urbanization is that we are not cities on the scale that Europe had in the 19th century. We are megacities, and to close down roads, to bring thousands of people together into a town square, to create events where artists can um, develop and work with communities, requires a huge amount of city leadership. And in 2012, we in London established the World Cities Cultural Forum, which is a network of major cities of a certain scale who believe that culture is very important to the success of our cities. <coughs> And it's a network that started with nine cities in 2012. It's expanded rapidly to 33. And their cities as diverse as Paris, 
Joburg, Buenos Aires, Shenzhen, Tokyo, and we all come together because we believe that cities cannot be simply about bricks and mortar. We have to have a soul and we have to have civic traditions. And we believe very strongly that culture and the artists can give meaning to our lives in a way that no other force can. And I hope that in the next decade or so, as, as the cities that we are working with come together, that we'll start to see new and interesting experiments. We'll start to see more events uh, like Lumia in those new cities where people are arriving for the first time and they don't feel uh, that sense of connection with other people, that events like Lumia will bring them together and will make them feel that they do belong. Thank you.